We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, church. Hey, y'all are incredible. I loved being able to sit and stand in the front here while y'all were worshiping and being able to hear y'all up here. That was incredible. Um, hey, my name is Mike Miller. I'm one of the pastors here, and I want to welcome you today. Um, today, we are going to be jumping into part three of Run to Win, where together we are going to learn biblical strategies for living a, a healthy and fulfilling life. Real quick, I know there's something that's a little distracting with this screen right here, kind of blinking in and out for those of you who are in the room. Online doesn't notice that. Uh, good for you. But in the room, we are having an issue, and we're going to get it fixed really soon. We have a solution uh, on its way. Also, we've been doing this thing for the last 21 days called 21 Days of Prayer. I'd encourage you, if uh, today should be some of your last days, but if you uh, have not started that, you still have an opportunity to go online and get the guide, uh, kind of read through the, the devotionals, sing some songs that we are all singing together uh, throughout the last 21 days, and, and pray and, and create a habit of prayer and devotion in your life. Amen? And so go online and do that. But today, we're jumping in, like I said, to part three of Run to Win, and we're opening, uh, our, our series scripture is 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. If not, it's on the screen behind me for as long as it's not blinking. Uh, but it says this, it says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone run, runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I might self be disqualified. So in other words, one day we are all going to stand before God, and I think with all our heart's desire, we should want to hear the words from God, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen. You know, one of the things that I have witnessed over the last several years of being in full-time ministry is that Christians tend to get held back in their life because they don't know how to get along with people. They don't know how to engage all the time with people. You know, when, when we get saved, we're taught in scripture that the old is supposed to, we're supposed to drop our old self, right? But instead what we do, a lot of the times what we tend to do is we, we bring this life of uh, resentfulness. We bring this, this old way of bitterness. And sometimes we bring pride a lot of the time, actually. We bring pride and we bring that into our walk with God. But the Bible says we're supposed to be renewing our mind with the truth of scripture daily. So how many of you actually want to hear those words when you get to heaven? Well done. I know I do. Listen, it starts here on earth. Uh, God wants you to win. I can promise you that. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just pray, Lord, that today you would meet us in this room. Allow us to encounter you in your spirit, Father. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Teach us how to have good relationships. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you didn't catch that today, we are, we are going to be talking about relational health. The first week uh, of this series, Pastor Matt talked about spiritual health and how it is the foundation of our well-being. In the second week, he talked about physical health and how God works through our bodies. And today, we're going to be talking about relational health. Now, I know if you've been here for a while in the past, every time we've talked about relation, relationships or relational health, we've talked about things like joining a life group. And I really think you all should, but I'm not going to be talking about that today. And so, uh, but I do want to mention, join a life group. It's incredible. Um, but like I said, it's not the direction for today. Relational health refers to the quality of our relationships with others. Now that includes your family, includes your friends, your coworkers, others. You know, I have a lot of people that are more like acquaintances, but not really friends, I guess you can say. Um, but it, it really is, it's about your relationship with others in general. So today we're going to take a look at what the Bible has to say about maintaining these relationships and keeping them healthy. And it actually has a lot to say about the topic. Today's topic, I think that it was uh, the Holy Spirit's doing, it's right in the middle of the series uh, and I think it's for a reason. If you think about it like this, once you are spiritually and physically healthy, 
Learning how to be relationally healthy is important because now you get to, you have a chance to help others toward their spiritual health and their physical health. And then uh, those, in those areas, when you're healthy in those areas, the next two parts of the message series uh, that you're going to be here for, hopefully the next Sunday and the Sunday after that, the next two weeks, um, it all, they also hinge on relational health, meaning that it's a lot easier to be healthy in every aspect of your life if you have others with the same mindset in your life, walking alongside you in your life, encouraging you every day or, or weekly even, and praying with you and holding you accountable. Church, I want you to, to do me a favor and grab those note sheets that you have, that you got on your way in if you have them. There's a quote on there that I want you to, to read through while I, while I uh, read it to you. And I want you to think about it throughout this entire week. And it says this, our effectiveness at relating to other people will oftentimes become the lid on our usefulness in building the kingdom of God. If you don't relate well to others or you aren't willing to keep growing in that area, you will stunt your own growth and ability to, ability to effectively minister to others. And I want to give you three areas of biblical wisdom for relational health. And then we're going to talk about those other four things that we keep bringing up throughout this whole series. That's put good stuff in, keep junk out, exercise, and be careful. Now, this, this message today is really practical. A lot of tips, a lot of lists, okay? And so the first point for today is effective communication or... The ability to clearly convey thoughts, ideas, and feelings to others and to understand the thoughts, ideas, and feelings of others. In other words, it goes both ways. Communication goes both ways. So what does the Bible have to say about this? It says in Colossians 4, 6, let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. I like to read it actually from the NIV version because it says gracious and seasoned with salt. Speaking of salt. I don't cook a lot because I'm terrible at it, but I have figured out how to, how to cook steak to perfection. I mean, to the point where we refuse to go out and waste money at these well-known establishments that is just going to overcook your meat. And by the way, uh, steak is either medium or medium rare. Never more than that, because you're not supposed to eat shoes. Um, but, you know, when I first moved back here to Maryland... This was like one of the things that blessed me the most in my life. I preached a message one day and, and I talked, uh, this is like our first month here, I think, and I, I talked about steak and how ribeye was the best and some other meats and stuff. And about a week later, I received at my doorstep a, a box of Omaha steaks from somebody anonymously. I don't know who you were. That was incredible. Best blessing I've ever received. Um, so if any of you need my shipping address, uh, get with me at the service, and I will gladly give it to you. But I'm not going to tell you how to cook these steaks, because uh, you can't, uh, it's really easy to mess up a, rib, a good ribeye. But I'll tell you this, salt is a key ingredient, not just in steaks, but in all your foods. If you forget salt, uh, you can forget it. You can be rest assured, your food, your steak, whatever you're cooking is as good as dirt, and it's not edible anymore. But not even in just steaks, you know, there's been times where I've been asked to come uh, hang out and eat something. They're like, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cook our favorite meal, the thing that we love to eat the most. And I'm like, sweet, I'm excited about this. And then I go to their house and I start eating it with them. And I'm like, so this is what you eat. Okay. I tell you this, there's a lot of people, hopefully no one in this room or watching online, that have not figured out what seasoning is. Salt is a seasoning and it's needed and all you're cooking. So hopefully I helped you with your cooking lesson for the day. But in the same way, Paul's trying to teach them that your conversations are going to either make it or break it with people. It's either, it's either going to build them up or it's going to cut them down. In fact, if you look back one scripture, he says, make the most of every opportunity. And the message Bible adds to it and says, don't miss the trick. If you can't catch on to this, the trick is salt, by the way, from the first thing that Paul said. But if you are in a conversation and the conversation is as good as dirt just because of the fact that you forgot to season the food, you might as well have closed the doors to your restaurant and expect your parking lot to be empty. You know, Paul thought it was important enough to tell another part of this recipe besides the seasoning, and he says it's grace. He says grace. He says remember to be gracious in your conversations. Remember, Paul, Paul is teaching them an ideal. What he's teaching them in this scripture that we just read is an ideal. And in this ideal, if, if you have ever breathed a breath, I think all of you have because you're all sitting here, you'd realize that not all of your conversations are going to be gracious. 
Some of them are going to be harsh. You know, when people hear the words gracious, a lot of times they immediately think soft-spoken or weak. You know, I can't even begin to tell you. I've heard it at least twice in the last week or so. How many times I hear people think that it's gracious to tell a boy who thinks he's a girl that he's a girl. That he's really, that's not gracious at all. That's, that's called evil. That's not, we're supposed to, as believers, we're supposed to be honest. We're supposed to have integrity. You know, this whole idea of what you see is what you get. That's what we're supposed to be like. You know, many people even think it's, it's gracious to not spank a child who's being disobedient. Let me tell you, how many times have you been at Walmart or like the mall or something? I was, uh, I was recently, I was at the gym at Gold at Marley and I seen uh, some people throwing basketballs like in, uh, kids throwing basketballs in the hallways where all this glass is, you know, and other things. And I'm like, man. And then at Walmart, I, I saw someone throw a lettuce and you're probably thinking, oh man, that kid just needs a hug, right? Absolutely not. You're probably thinking, if you're anything like me, you're thinking, that kid needs a whooping. <laughs> I like to, I like to uh, sometimes if I'm feeling up to it, like joking around, I'll be like, hey, you need to borrow my belt and uh, see if they're those kinds of parents. Sometimes they're like, are you crazy? Look, it, I think it's important for us to understand this. You know, the, the, world, they, the world loves to gaslight us, us believers. They take these, these scriptures that we're reading and they, and they think that if they change the meaning, of the, the meaning of the words, if they can change it in your mind, you know, they, they pretend like they, they know how to follow Christ more than us, more than you do. And the letters to the church were written to the church about how they interact with each other. And we practice it here in the church so that we can use it out there in the world. Remember it said, it said this, gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Now you should respond differently to everyone. You should be responding differently in different cases. Now, because grace responds differently to different things. Matter of fact, in scripture, you would, if you really pay attention, you'd see four different faces, so to speak, of love from Jesus. But that's for another message. That's a lot to get into, so we're not going to open that up today. But grace or gracious, being gracious, it's, it's honest. It's not deceptive. In James 1.19, it says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen and what? Slow to speak and slow to get angry. I'll tell you this. It took me a long, a long time to figure this out because as a teenager in, uh, in high school and all that, I, was, I had some anger issues. But once I figured it out, it made sense to me that, that if you are quick to listen and slow to speak, it's like a chain reaction. You're going to be slower or slow in general to get angry. It's a chain reaction. And you know, I believe firmly that there's a reason why God gave you two ears and one mouth. Do you all agree with that? All right, so let's move on. Proverbs 15, 1, it reminds us this. It says, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. Now, this doesn't mean that you should never be uh, direct, or it doesn't mean that you should never be, ha or have to be harsh sometimes. It means that your default position, your natural tendency, because you are a human is to want to act defensively. It's, it's so easy when you hear something, uh, what you think is an attack or something, and it, it might not even be an attack, but you immediately get defensive. That's your default position. When you give in to that default position, it's going to cause some harm on you, mentally, emotionally, even other ways. You know, there are times where you're going to have to be harsh. As a pastor, there's been some difficult decisions that I have had to make that seemed really harsh, uh, especially to outsiders looking in when they don't know the whole story, especially when dealing with musicians. I'll tell you what, musicians are some of the hardest people to, to deal with. Uh, I'm one of them, so I could talk about this really easily, but the, there's, musicians tend to have this tendency all over the world, not just here in, the, in America, but all over the world, musicians have this natural tendency to think that their gift and their calling is the same thing, and it's not. There's two completely different things. You're supposed to use your gift for your calling. It is not your calling. There are times where as a leader, I've had several tough conversations that were supposed to not be harsh, and it didn't start harsh, but then it had to shift that way because of the way that the conversation was going. I mean, even outside of my own examples that I could give you, if you look at the, the, the story of Jesus flipping the table in the synagogue, you remember, I love that story because I love to reference it when I'm feeling a little uh, 
frustrated. Let's put it like that, where I'm like, if Jesus did it, I could do it. And, uh, and then I, I don't flip tables. I haven't before, uh, but I sometimes want to. Um, but if you read the account of this story from the book of John, there's something that Jesus did. He didn't act out of impulse anger at all. If you read the story carefully, what you'll see is Jesus sat down. And what do you do sometimes when you sit down and you're angry? You sit down, you, if you take the time to sit down and think for a second, you tend to start having all these thoughts, right? You start thinking, man, what would I say to this person when they come back? What, what am I going to do to this person whenever I see them again? You start to have all these thoughts. I can only imagine Jesus. Jesus sat down and he started to braid the whip that he used to whip them out of the, out of the temple because of what they were doing. Can you imagine? I, I, I love to sit there and imagine what Jesus was thinking. Like, man, I, I, I'm going to smite them with fire into the pit of hell or something. I don't know what he would think, but I don't even know what I would be thinking if I had this thing. I'm making a whip to whip them out. My point is this. Look, well, before I get it, this could really easily turn into a parenting message. So I'm going to say one thing to the parents in the room, and then I'll move on from that. But when you are angry at your child for disobedience or, disobedience or whatever the case is, don't spank them while you're still angry. Take time to deal with your own impulse anger first because it just makes it a lot easier, especially when you go to tell them and explain to them uh, why it's necessary. It makes it so much better that way. But this passage is saying this. Many times we just react rather than respond. And when we react, we have to then constantly deal with those reactions from that moment on. And, and, and most of what you do in your life when dealing with conflict should be to deal with that initial response, like if, as though you're going to go spank your kid. It should be to deal with that initial response within yourself first. And I'll tell you what, it gets a lot, I think, more difficult as you get older. You think that wisdom and experience help. It really does. But we, if you really think about it, we turn from a know-it-all when we're younger to a know-it-all that's just older now, right? You're experiencing yourself like, you're like, now I actually know this. I've experienced, I've walked through this, so now I know it even more. So now really nobody can tell me any different. So you really turn from a know-it-all to a know-it-all, and wisdom and experience do help, but it becomes more difficult because now you've got this aftermath that has, you have to deal with. When you have a reaction versus a response, you've got a lot more huge shifts in your life that could come from that, really difficult ones that you'd have to get through that are tough. And that's what Paul is teaching us, is that we need to control that, that, that initial response, that, that reaction. So real quick, I'm going to give you eight practical uh, uh, practices of effective communication. Now, I'm going to go through these lists as quick as I can for the sake of time. And uh, they are blanks on your note sheet, so you can take notes on them. But these are real practical things. I'm not giving you like some really deep theological thing. However, this is all uh, biblical. So number one, practice active listening. Pay full attention to the person speaking. Make eye contact with them to show them that you are paying attention to what they are saying. I can't even begin to tell you how annoying it is to be mid-conversation with someone and they pull out their phone and start scrolling Facebook or some other social media account or whatever they're doing, texting someone else. They're not giving you attention, that's for sure. Pay, uh, practice active listening. And then number two, practice reflective listening. In other words, repeat back to the person that's talking to you what they said to confirm if you understood it correctly. And when a person's being uh, super like uh, defensive, I, I, you, I could tell you, if you repeat back to them and say, I think this is what I hear you saying, they are going to respond back a, a lot differently than if you just respond in any other way. So, to, so try to clarify what they are saying first, and oftentimes they'll respond with a bit less frustration. So number three is use I statements. Instead of saying, you did this wrong, try saying something like, I feel frustrated when you do this because, fill in the blank. And this really just helps on your own feelings. It helps you to focus on your own feelings rather than accusing the other person. And it really shifts perspectives on both sides if you really think about it. Another thing that I'd encourage you to do is to never, or to avoid using the word always and never in your conversations, and especially in your arguments. Because, uh, you know, if you think about it like this, before Christ, we were all bad people that sometimes did good, right? But after Christ, we were good people that sometimes do bad. And I think that if we, look, if we went to other people in these times of conflict and we had that perspective when we go into our conversations, things are going to be a lot uh, easier to deal with at that point. Number four is avoid interrupting. This is a pet peeve of mine. 
I mean, let a brother finish his sentence before you start talking, right? It, 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 can, be, it, it can be really hard if you are trying to get your, your statement out or your conversation is, is becoming lopsided because the person keeps uh, interrupting. Look, just stop thinking about your response while they are trying to finish their sentence. You're going to find yourself jumping the gun and will cause the person to feel undervalued. Number five is acknowledge nonverbal communication. Body language is key, y'all. Uh, tone of voice, eye contact, all that stuff. If you ever walk into someone's office, if you have an office, if you're one of those blessed people with an office and you walk in and they, uh, or to their office, I guess, and you start talking to them and they turn and see you and then they turn back towards their computer, it's not the right time. Just walk out and come back later or schedule an appointment. Uh, if they are sitting at a table with you in conversation and they are turning their body a certain way, uh, it's like shifting their body away from you, they're really in their mind mentally wanting to get out of that conversation. And so you got to pay some attention to body language, eye contact, and tone of voice. It'll tell you a lot. Number six is seek to understand. There's a quote that someone spoke to me back in 20, uh, like 2017 or 2018 or so, and, and I've tried my best to remember this every day, and that is to seek first to understand, then to be understood. To try to see things from the other person's perspective before trying to force them to see your perspective. And then be clear and concise. Avoid rambling and going off on tangents. Stick to the main points rather than extending the length of what you're saying to them. That really doesn't do any good. It just causes confusion. There's something our, our pastoral team tends to remind each other of here when we're, uh, ta- when we're communicating about different things, many different like uh, events and other stuff, and that is that clarity is kindness. Because if you can't be clear and concise, I- I'd encourage you that the best thing that you could do is to just uh, to pause until you can be clear and concise. And we do it all the time. How, m- how many of you, how many times have, have you really wanted to talk to someone, but then you back off because you have your own insecurities and, and and then you miss the opportunity to tell them what they really needed to hear. And then you just go about your whole week feeling guilty or feeling some kind of uh, uh, emotion that you can't really describe. And you're sitting there going, I mean, I really should have said this to them. Now they think that's okay. But if I go back to them now, it's going to make it worse. And, you know, this clarity is kindness. I believe that, I've always told people this, that if there's something good to be said, say it. If there's something bad to be said, say it. And then let them, re- let them choose how they're going to respond or react. That's up to them. It's called being honest, by the way. And number eight is be open and honest. Anyone ever seen the movie Frozen? Yeah. First service, I don't think they had any young kids because, like, nobody saw it. Except for the young, like, the young people that were in the room. But I think I watched Frozen at least 5,000 times when it first came out. My daughter's here in the front row. It's her fault. Um, Probably at least five. And, and then there's the soundtrack that gets played you know, over. Thank goodness she's out of that phase. Uh, but there was a, a, a song on it called Let It Go. Y'all remember that one? It has this line in there that really is gaslighting at its finest. I'm going to ruin the song for you for a second. It says, conceal it, don't feel it. And, and that just doesn't work. It doesn't work. You've got to let it go. See what I did there? <laughs> All right, take y'all a second to get on. Look. Be genuine and authentic in your communication. Don't hide your true feelings or intentions. People can see right through that unauthentic behavior, by the way. They see right through it. And if you're open and honest, you'll save yourself from a lot of conflicts uh, the first time. And you know what happens really when you're not open and honest? People start to withdraw from relationship with you because a lack of trust. And trust is really, really hard to rebuild once it's broken. So now that that song is stuck in your head for the rest of the day, Sorry, but I'm also not sorry. So what can I say except you're welcome? (laughs) Got it. Yeah, there you go. There's another song stuck in your head. So there you go. So what if you've done it all right or as close to right as you could? It says this in Romans 12, 18. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Listen, there will be times when you've done everything that you could and it just doesn't work out the way that you hoped. And so now you've got to move on to the next thing that we call conflict resolution. Conflict resolution is number two, by the way. Conflict resolution is the process of finding a, peacefully, a peaceful and mutually acceptable way to resolve a disagreement or dispute between two or more parties. Now, the Bible is really clear on how to deal with conflicts. I can't even begin to tell you how often I witness believers, including myself at times, I'm guilty of it at times, kind of skirting around this passage of scripture 
I've, I've done it myself, and I have to remind myself uh, often when there's conflict what these steps are. So we're going to read this scripture, and then we're going to go through the conflict resolution steps. In Matthew 18, 15 through 17, it says, If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. I don't like those tax collectors. There are five clear steps to conflict resolution. Number one is this, identify the problem. Now, you know, most problems that go unresolved come from assumption, right? Ask yourself, is this issue, is what, what is this issue that's causing this conflict? Like, is it really an issue? And if there's any room for assumption in there, you got to dig deep within yourself to find out if it's your own perspective or if there really is an issue first. And then you address the issue privately. That's what a lot of people forget. They immediately go to, I'm about to tell all my friends about this. I'm about to tell all their friends about this and turn them against that person to get them on my side. They start talking about it, right? Address the issue privately. Oftentimes, this should clear up an entire conflict. Many times, you're going to walk away with your assumption being squashed. And if there still is an issue and it isn't resolved in that step, only then do you do number three, which is to bring in witnesses. Now, the Bible hates dishonest scales. You read that all throughout the Bible, uh, especially in the Old Testament. It hates dishonest scales. This just really, it just evens out the scales, all right? Now, if there is still an issue that's not resolved, maybe the other party is not willing to be repentive or to ask for forgiveness, or they're not willing to do anything other than maybe argue back or deny. That's when you bring it to the church leaders. But please, hear me out with this, please... Don't bring it to us without having done the other, st the other steps first. Because what you've done now, if you've brought it to us, is, well, first, we're going to go, stop, and, which might offend you because we're not going to even let you finish your sentence. We're going to say, did you talk to them first? Go talk to them. But let's say, you know, what happens when you do that is now we're curious, and what we do hear about, now we've got to go get to the other side of it to see if the scales are even honest. Um, and it just brings a lot of weight that we don't really, uh, we shouldn't have to bear if you've done your, your, your steps correctly. Identify the problem, address the issue privately, and bring in witnesses. Then bring it to us. You know, this almost never happens. But sometimes all of those uh, things don't work. And then we have to do number five, which is regard them as a corrupt tax collector or a pagan. In other words, kick them out of the church. And listen, repentance can't happen without confronting it. Confrontation, it, it is not always easy. Uh, I'd say most of the time, it's hard for most people, but it is necessary. And this passage is key to that, to, to dealing with conflicts in a biblical way. The Bible says in this, and, and says this in Titus 3, 10 through 11, it says, if people are causing divisions among you, give a first and second warning. After that, having nothing more to do with them, for people like that have turned away from the truth and their own sins condemn them. In other words, warn them once, warn them twice, and then throw them out the church, right? Like we don't ever, we don't ever want to close the doors here at ACC on someone. We want people to come even if there's an issue so that they can hopefully encounter Jesus and, and, and have that, their life turned around. You know, I can't, I can't even begin to count on my hands or tell you by memory or anything how many times we get... Uh, guest cards or how many conversations we have where the guests are saying, man, I feel so loved and so welcomed when I came to ACC. And it's not just because we're a friendly church. I think everybody here is super friendly. But what it is is because we, we strive for unity here at ACC, for godly unity. And, and the Bible teaches us that where there is unity, God commands a blessing. He doesn't suggest a blessing. He commands a blessing. In the church, we are unified under Christ. It's not about the color of your skin or your ethnicity. It's not about the, the, how much money you have or you don't have. It's not about your political stance. It's not about the gift you have or don't have. It's not about your calling. It's about our identity in Christ, who we are in Christ. We're all sons and daughters of Christ, of, of the living God, by the way. Point number three for biblical wisdom of relational health is this, healthy boundaries. 
Listen, I believe that having healthy boundaries is heavily connected to allowing God to do big things in your life. You know, there's only so many seconds in the day, so many minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years. You only have one life. You have one life, and in that lifetime, you can't do everything. You can't give everything to everybody all the time. It's really impossible. It's just not possible. If you want God to really do incredible things in your life, and through your life even, you have to learn to set healthy boundaries and expectations. Paul, Paul teaches us this in 1 Corinthians 6.12. He says, You say, I am allowed to do anything. But not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. So sure, I I can accept all the meeting requests. I can help everyone all the time and, and, and try to meet their needs all the time and be everyone's solution. It's allowed. People, they'll, they'll enjoy it. They'll, they'll appreciate it. But you can't allow yourself to be mastered by anything other than God. And then in verse 14, he says, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live in darkness? You know, we as believers, I think that we need to get better at this, especially with the season that we are going to, the direction that the world is headed. There's a book that we recently read, as a a lot of the staff read it, called This Present Darkness. Um, And in that book, it talks a lot about the spiritual realms um, and what's going on even physically. And, you know, whatever we're doing here on earth and then what happens in the spiritual realm. And I think it's, 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 un, it, it's something that we need to remember is that when God has something planned, and I think God is going to do something huge, by the way, around here especially. When God has something planned, the enemy is going to have a counterattack planned all the time. And uh, we have to learn to draw boundaries with the world and sometimes with one another. So I'm going to give you some tips on how to set healthy boundaries now. Number one is to set limits on how much time and energy you give to others. You may not realize it, but you have a hierarchy, a list of priorities in your life. And some of you would would probably not want to admit what you're prioritizing. It's easy to let one lower priority or what should be lower shift over one another without realizing it. It's easy to let them kind of uh, jump around. But the hierarchy, it should be this. It should be God first, and then your spouse if you're married, your kids if you have them, your church, your spiritual family. You have a responsibility to your spiritual family, and then your work and friends and everything else. And and, and you've got to set time limits too. It's too easy with all the distractions around you in the world to let a lower priority take precedent and take the spot of a top priority or I like to say like take the front seat of those priorities of what they should be in the what should be in the front seat even even Jesus didn't give equal time and energy to everybody you take his, take the lesson from him number two is communicate boundaries clearly let others know what you're comfortable with and what you aren't you don't have to be mean about it by the way you can you just need to be clear remember we talked about earlier clarity is kindness I've heard it said that uncommunicated expectations become missed expectations. You know, we all talk about it's, it's, we don't clearly communicate these things because of fear of failure or fear of letting someone down. Fear, fear in general, by the way, it's not an excuse. Because in 1 John 4, 18, it says, such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. And if we're afraid, it is for the fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced this perfect love. Number three is this, be considerate, be considerate. Don't push or try to change someone else's boundaries to fit your needs. I like to joke around with people a lot. When, I'm, when I ask them to do something with me over like the weekend or something, or if they want to do, uh, grab dinner or, I don't know, go hunting with me or something, I'm like, hey, man, you want to go hunting on the weekend? Like, you know, Saturdays, get out there in the woods, just do something. And if they're like, no, nah, I got to work, I'm like, quit. You should quit. Of course, I'm joking with them. I, I, would never, I would never actually want them to quit their job just to come hang out with me for a few hours. And I don't, over, I don't hold it over their heads or make them feel bad. I move on, and I let them know they're going to be missed. But at the same time, I'm still going to have a lot more fun than them. So I do make sure they, they're aware of that. Philippians 2, 3 says, Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. And then number four, it's a big one. Learn to say yes or no. 
You know, it's important to set boundaries. It's important to say no to requests or demands that don't align with your values or priorities. It's a huge pet peeve of mine when someone's like, I already have plans, I'm still going to say yes, and then I'm just not going to show up. I, I hate, I shouldn't say that maybe. I really dislike like waiting on people to tell me they're going to be somewhere. Matthew 5, 7, just say, 5, 37, just say a simple yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. This verse encourages us to be honest and straightforward with our communication. You know, when I, when I first got into, into full-time ministry, it was really hard for me to say no to things. Uh, I, had a, I had a pastor who was my direct oversight, my leader, who uh, was pretty unhealthy when it came to leadership. And he would bark demands at me in a way that I felt like if the church, I mean, he literally told me, if the church doors were open, you need to be there. If the offices are open, you need to be there. If we are doing an event, you need to be there. It was so bad to the point where me and my wife flew up here for a a funeral that was in our family and on her side of the family. And while we were here, we were only here for a few days so far. We, I mean, the funeral was on like a Friday or Saturday, I can't remember exactly. And uh, they decided to bring in a guest speaker at the last minute on Sunday. And I got a call even though HR had cleared, cleared my, uh, what do they call that time when you're off for, your, for family death, bereavement, cleared all of that, it was on the calendar, and, and, and the lead pastor called me and said, uh, yeah, you need to come back, we have a guest speaker. I was like, we, we, I mean, I have like four more days of bereavement, and he's like, no, no, you're flying back today. I was like, all right, so I, I developed this mentality that, that kind of broke my priority list, my hierarchy in my mind, and it told me, All right, so God is supposed to be first, but I work at a church, so I guess that's first. And it became something that was starting to ruin my marriage and ruin my relationship with my family and my friends even. It became something that was really hard. I let a lower priority sit in the front seat in my head. It made me feel so guilty for years. I thought, thought, you know, because I worked at this church, that's to say, I'm doing what God's called me to do. So that must mean that I guess I don't get to take time off. I didn't go, like, it was like three or four years before I had a full weekend off or a vacation, let alone. I mean, I was, you know, the Bible teaches us that a Sabbath is not a recommendation. The Sabbath day rest is a command. It's like, it's one of those things where I completely disregarded for myself because I worked at a church and I was doing what God called me to do. I didn't Sabbath rest for a long time. And then what happened is, I felt like I hit a brick wall, like mentally, I was so broken, I was drained, I was beat up, uh, emotionally, spiritually, physically even, I just wasn't healthy in any aspect of my life. I mean, my marriage was on the rocks, like I said, my priorities were all kinds of twisted. It took several years for me to figure it out, and to this day, when something happens like that, I still have guilty feelings because of what was hammered into me back then, uh, you know, years ago. Uh, thank, Thank goodness, thank God for the, the pastor that spoke directly to me and my wife at a network event that we were at and, and, and uh, really helped us figure out how to manage that. But nowadays, I schedule my Sabbaths, and I'd encourage you to do the same thing. You know, there's not some, you're not supposed to do anything on your Sabbath. Your Sabbath day is supposed to be holy. You're supposed to spend time with God and rest. I would include in there, be with your family, and, and especially if you're the, the man of the house. Teach your family to spend time with God on those days. And maybe throw in a little bit of something that that uh, gives you life and brings you joy in the same time. But that's it. So if you ever call me when I'm in the woods, I'm not answering because that's my Sabbath. I'm hunting, all right? So this scripture reminds us to be careful about making promises and commitments to people that we may not be able to to keep and to avoid saying things that that may be misleading or deceptive. So let your yes be yes and your no be no. And y'all don't get caught up in the in-between because the in-between really just causes hurt and harm and confusion. So church, as we, as we end every service here, I want you to ask yourself this question. What now, God? What now? H- how do we pursue relational health? We've talked about uh, tips on having effective communication and conflict resolution and, and healthy boundaries. I've given you all these tips, right? But I want to make this as simple as I can for you to walk out of here and start to heal these broken relationships or even make your current relationships stronger and healthier. Number one, put good stuff in. You do that. You, you have, a, have good relationships that push you towards Christ instead of ones that pull you away from him. Remember to spend time in his word and renew your mind daily. Have it in your heart so that you can recognize when things aren't of God and even who isn't of God. 
Proverbs 12, 26 says, the godly give good advice to their friends and the wicked lead them astray. Y'all, I'll I, I tell you this, healthy relationships are not supposed to leave you feeling drained when you walk away from the conversation or hanging out with them. It, if it leaves you feeling drained, it's not healthy. It, it, it leaves you, what a healthy relationship does is it leaves you feeling encouraged to pursue God with all your heart. The things that don't, the things that they say are not supposed to lead you down paths that the world has laid out, but it's supposed to walk you uh, towards pursuing righteousness. Number two, keep junk out. Set your boundaries and don't shift from them. When, when you start to shift from your boundaries, it's only a matter of time before you do it again and again and again and again, and you can't get out of that cycle. Next thing you know, you, your boundaries are so skewed, you don't even remember what they are anymore. So now anything that comes your way, you're saying yes to, or you're saying no to even in an unhealthy way. Be intentional about keeping your Sabbath holy and don't let distractions in during those times of rest. Number three is exercise. And, and when and talking about relational health, I'd say it's really easy to write this one off. A lot of people say that, you know, this relationship, relationship is either gonna work or it's not. It does take time for a relationship to be healthy. It takes time to, to work. It takes work, it is work. It takes exercise, exercise, patience and kindness. Take. Take the necessary time to cool off before you respond to things to make sure that your responses are healthy and not filtered through anger and frustration, but instead they're filtered through the love of God. And then be careful. Be careful to not let your priorities slip. Put God first always, your family next, your spiritual family after that, and then the rest. Look, ultimately there is one relationship that that if it's not healthy, it really isn't possible to be or to live life with relational help with, with health with anyone else. And that relationship is with Jesus Christ. You know, it can be hard, maybe impossible sometimes to, to do all these things perfectly. But if you have a relationship with Jesus, look, y'all have help at that point. You know, while some of the, the, these things won't come naturally, some will because of the Holy Spirit living in your life. And, and with the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you're gonna know when you need to ask for forgiveness. You're gonna know when you need to, to pursue making a change that makes your life healthier. He's gonna to speak to you and guide you and comfort you and, and drive you towards health. And that starts with your relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, we don't do this often here, but I'm gonna ask you to do me a favor today and bow your heads and close your eyes. And I'm gonna ask you again this question. Really, I want you to ask yourself this question. What now, God? What now? Maybe you're sitting in this room and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, but something is giving you a nudge in your mind and in your heart. And that nudge isn't, it's not a coincidence. The, the feeling that you have isn't just your emotions hoping for a good friendship or a good relationship. That nudge is your spirit, the Holy Spirit saying, it's time for you to come into relationship with your Savior. And if that's you today, I want you to do me a favor and just raise your hand. I'm, I'm not going to ask you to stand or come forward. I just want you to raise your hand real quick and let me know. There's a couple hands up here in the front. Amen. And also, I'm going to ask you this. Maybe, maybe you already have relationship with Christ, but you know that you've let your priorities get mixed up. This is a big one, for, especially for me. Or you've been doing your own thing and, and you're not really pursuing growing closer to him. And making their relationship and making that relationship with Jesus healthier the way that it should be. And you want to recommit to putting Christ first in your life. I want you to go ahead and raise your hand as well today. All over the room. Look at that. All right, so if you're saying, Pastor Mike, that's me, I want to put my life first. Uh, I want to put Christ in my life first. Make him the priority at all times. It's your opportunity right now to shift your focus, to put Christ first and to strengthen that relationship so that you can walk with relational health. So I want you to do me a favor, everyone in this room, regardless if you raised your hand or not, I want you to say this simple prayer with me out loud. Just repeat after me and say, Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and I invite you to come into my heart and my life. And I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. And I commit to put you first in everything that I do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Y'all listen closely. 
If this was, if you were one of the few that raised your hands and this was your first time that you gave, given your life to Christ, if, if you received Christ for the first time today, I want to invite you to take the next steps of faith, which is to get baptized. We have everything that you need if you wanted to do that today. We have shirts, towels, shorts, flip-flops, everything. We have it all for you, and we'll get you baptized today if that's what you want. But if you don't know what baptism is, I'd encourage you to take a, a baptism growth course that we have coming up uh, pretty soon as well, and that'll teach you everything that you need to know. If you're online, let us know if you said that prayer for the first time today or if you are committing your life to, to prioritizing Christ first in your life. Let us know. We want to connect with you as well. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.